So, um, this is our quarterly, sounds wrong, uh, every four um, lessons recap on the last three lessons. So the last three lessons are in kind of reverse chronological order. It was what to do if you transferred last week, the week before that was roughing finesse, and the week before that was jumping as a responder. So I'm just going to go over them five minutes or so. And then in these hands I've kind of mishmashed all of the above with some random stuff as well. So you've got all sorts going on. Um, so, jumping as a responder. Now, I briefly spoke about supporting your, your partner. I'm not going to go over that too much. But the whole premise of jumping when you're supporting is that it's non-forcing. So, when you jump and support your partner in the same action, one something, three somethings of the same, um, you are supporting them so it is non-forcing. Whenever you did the same suit, it's non-forcing. And it's simply a, I have a fit for you, I have this many points, or this many losers, depending on your balance or unbalanced. So a single jump, double jump, triple jump, in the same suit, is always just natural. There's no fanciness going on, it's just, I like your suit that you opened. If you jump in a second suit, i.e. a new suit, that's where the com complexity comes in. One banana, let's say diamonds, and two of something else. Now, traditional alcohol would say that that is a strong jump shift. It's a shift because you are shifting which suit you're bidding. You're not bidding diamonds, you're bidding a new suit, hearts. And alcohol would say that that's 16 plus. Now, what I mentioned when I spoke about this was that that doesn't happen very often. You don't often have 16 plus and a six card suit. You more frequently have some anywhere up to 16. I mean, 16 is super rare, basically, when, you, when your partner's open the bidding. So, <coughs> if you had a really good hand, because this is a new suit, one heart would be forcing. So therefore, if one heart is forcing, which, which I mean categorically 100% forcing, how much more you forcing... Mean one diamond? Yeah, sorry. No, I mean one heart, in response to one diamond. Oh yeah, one heart, sorry. Sorry? Um, in response to one heart, the, uh, sorry, in response to one diamond, one heart is categorically forcing. Your partner will bid again. Because don't forget, when they've opened the bidding, they've promised to bid twice assuming you bid something that is forcing. A new suit is forcing because that is six to any number of points. There's no limits yet, because all you're trying to do is let your partner rebid to learn about their hand. So if that's 100% forcing, how forcing do you want two hearts? It's pointless. It's pointless for two hearts to be a mega super force, because you don't need it. If your hand was good, you would just bid one heart and wait to see what your partner does. I.e., the better you are, the slower you go. The same principle running throughout our bidding. So therefore, Two hearts being 16 plus I've got a slam interested hand is sort of a wasted bid because two hearts being a strong bid won't come up very frequently. So you're in a sense wasting a bid there because your strong hand should be going through one. Having a strong bid as a jump doesn't often work well because you're consuming room. So what I suggested was that your good hands go through one heart and therefore your weak hands can be two hearts, just like a weak two. So if you open two hearts, that's six cards in a weekend. If you rebid, if you sorry, if you respond to two hearts, that is a weekend with six cards. And if you overcall jump to two hearts, that's a weekend with six hearts. So if this hand opens one diamond, two hearts is weak. If this hand opens one diamond, two hearts is weak. And if no one opens one diamond, two hearts is weak. So I thought that's more sensible because it's straightforward. Whenever you jump to two hearts, whoever you are, it's a hand with a week, six card suit and a week. Therefore. What is weak? Well, I said to five to eight points. You can sort of smudge the edges if you like, but the thing that's definitely true is that you have six cards. You must have six cards in the suit to be semi-insisting upon that suit. You are suggest strongly suggesting that suit. You only need four cards to bid them at the one level because you might have a balanced hand, you might just have four cards, six points. This is a lot more loose. This is quite specific. So jumping in a new suit as a responder should be a weak jump shift rather than a strong jump shift, simply based on likelihood of it appearing in random dealt hands. What that means is, if a jump to two hearts is weak, what is one heart than two hearts? Surely that's stronger, and one heart than three hearts stronger still by the, by the responder. So therefore, one heart followed by two hearts is invitational, and one heart followed by three hearts is game forcing. It's not good for it, game forcing. Is, is that your opening now? You've won half No, the responded, oh, responded to that. Now I'm imagining that we're getting another bite of the cherry, i.e. we get two rounds of bidding. The reason I'm pretty confident of that is because our one half bid was forcing, so our partner yeah. should bid again. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. and therefore you get the second bit to describe your strength. So the reason this works better is twofold. In the old, old-fashioned ways, to show a weak hand, you would go one, then two. That's the weakest way of bidding in ACOM, which is not what we, we do. we're kind of veering away. Which means one, then two is weak, which means one, then three is, is invitational, which means one, then four is game-forcing. So th- doing it this way around, you have a weak bid, an invitational bid, and a game-forcing bid, all a level lower. Everything is actually better. The reason for that is you've sacrificed the 16 plus hand because it doesn't happen. So you've sacrificed using one of your bids for the hand that you never get. So that you can use these bids for the hands you actually do get. Follow me? <coughs> so jumping as a responder, showing a weak bid, means that all of your other bids can come down one tier. Instead of one then two being weak, if you were weak, you would have already bid two. So one then two is invitational. And then one then three is game force. All with six or more cards in the suit. Always six or more cards. By rebidding the suit, you're promising six. Absolutely promising six. So it's just your strength, whether you're varying how many levels you're bidding, essentially. What is invitational? Um, I would say nine to 11, and game forcing any 12 count or above. I'm happy to game force with 12 because our partner's got an opening hand, we've got an opening hand. We want to be in game somewhere. Yes, it's plausible they've got 11 and zero hearts, and I'm game forcing with only 23 between us and no fit, but it's highly unlikely. That would be very unfortunate if they had zero hearts and the absolute minimum number of points. So I'm happy to game force with 12. If you like, you can put 12 in here and game force with 13 if you feel safer that way. But my personal take is an opening hand opposite an opening hand, be in game, and you'll be right most of the time. Okay? So jumping in a new suit is a weak bid rather than a strong bid. Instinctively, you would think one club jump to two spades. That would be quite a strong action. You would instinctively think that. But it's actually the opposite of your intuition. The weaker you are, the faster you go. The stronger you are, the slower you go. So our response is all tying in with that. And that's what weak jump shifts are about. Tying everything in with the same system. Weak jump over calls, weak twos, weak jump shifts. All the same thing, just by different people. Not by different things. Jumping in no trumps is the only thing that I... I didn't skirt around it particularly, but I kind of mentioned you don't really do it. The only time you could ever jump in no trumps and it not be artificial. Don't forget a jump in no trumps after a major should be jack of two no trumps if you play it. So one spade, two no trumps. That should be jack of because it's artificial. If you don't play jack of then that's natural. But again, there should be, a, if, if that were natural, there should be a more sensible bit. You should just bid your suit. You've consumed a lot of room there unnecessarily. So whatever your longest suit is, you can do that instead. If you've got 11 or 12 points, which is what you're trying to say, if you don't play Jack Big, then two clubs, two diamonds, or two hearts would have all said 10 plus points, but have also described your suit. So it's more descriptive to try and bid a suit. Essentially, you don't really jump in no trumps. Because if you jump in no trumps, there's nearly always a suit you should have bid. If your partner opened one club, jumping to two no trumps sort of can't be right, because why aren't you bidding one diamond, one heart, or one spade? I suppose you could only have clubs, in which case, why aren't you supporting clubs? There isn't really a world where you jump in no trumps and it be the right thing. So therefore, don't really do it. Jumping in no trumps on the second or third round of bidding, fair enough. You've had a chance to find out what your partner's got. For example, uh, I'm only talking about the very first bid here. One diamond, one heart, one no trump. 15 to 17 balance. Fair enough, jump to three no trumps. If you think three no trumps is the right contract, bid three no trumps. I'm not frightened of jumping in no trumps. It's the very first bid where I think it's the wrong thing to do. Because if you just bid three no trumps over one diamond, how do you know if you've not got a major fit or not? I suppose you might not have majors, but how do you not know you've missed a slam? Why have you not investigated? You've just sort of shut the bidding down without ab- ab- giving your side the chance to find anything out. So jumping in no trumps as a responder is your, pr- your primary bid is, is rare. I suppose the only time you would really, really do it is if partnering one no trump and you just not bother about anything other than three no trumps. Here, the reason jumping to three no trumps is sort of okay is that you know they're limited. 12 to 14, there's no real inquiry other than a major inquiry, and it would appear you don't have one there. Okay? Right. Roughing finesse. I appreciate these hands can't exist all at the same time because that would mean a very, very unusual shape. 
If you treat all these suits in isolation, so try to imagine that these these excuse me, these twelve cards aren't in the same hand necessarily. I've just done a spade <laughs> suit and a heart suit and a hand suit. Um, a roughing finesse is essentially when you use the threat of trumping as the way of fishing out that particular card you're interested in. So rather than a, a finesse of leading to the ace queen, let's say, your threat is the ace. The person with the king is frightened of the ace. When you're doing a roughing finesse, the person you're trying to threaten, they should be frightened of the trumping values, so the fact you don't have that particular suit. So if you look at the spade suit, for example, imagining any other suit other than spades were trumps, if you leave the king, imagining west has the ace, which is a 50% chance, if they play their ace on your king, you can then trump it in whatever trumps are, and then your queen and jack will be winners. So you finesse the ace out of them by playing the king, Okay, they might not play the ace, but let's say they do play the ace. You trump it, then you can get back here and these queen, this queen jack are winners. That's a roughing finesse because you'll finesse the ace and then you trumped it and your trump was the way of beating that card. And therefore you've established these goodies here by roughing finessing it. Imagine they didn't play the ace, the king was led and they played a baby one. You would then throw something away in the hope that the person with the ace is underneath the trumps rather than after the trumps. So you play the king, they play small, you throw something away, and then they don't play the ace of spades, you know where the ace of spades is. Of course, if the roughing finesse fails, it goes king, low, low, ace, then the finesse fails. But even in that world, you've still set this queen and jack up. So you've lost a trick, seemingly unnecessarily, but you've still established winners. So the idea is taking a finesse like normal through a particular opponent and threatening them with the third card you're going to play. But the threat here is the trump rather than a big card. So it's like a special variant of the finesse. Removing the spades, so that they don't distract you. This, that's like a, a natural roughing finesse, avoid opposite king, queen, jack. You can create a roughing finesse here by doing the same thing, but first you've got to do something. First you've got to create the void to have the rough as the threat. So in this instance, play the ace of hearts, assuming they don't play the king, which will be very, very friendly of them when they don't know why rub one out, so I could do this. Um, they won't play the king, unless you pay them off or something. So now you've created the void in hearts, and you're in the same position as before. You're missing the top card, you have the cards underneath it, you can do the rooking finesse again. Leading the queen, threatens this person if they've got the king, doesn't threaten this person if they've got the king. So let's say they've got the king, because all the finesses work on the board. You then trump it in whatever trumps are, and then you set the jack ten up. Same premise, but you've created the void there. So king, queen, jack, opposite a void, ace, queen, jack, opposite a singleton, that kind of jazz. Now interestingly, with the hearts, you could have done a natural finesse. You could have led low to the queen, hoping that the king was here. That would be a normal finesse. The reason that's not as good odds is because you can't do it more than once. You leave the low to the queen, that wins, and then you want to leave another one to the jack, and you haven't got any more. So if there is a roughing finesse, it tends to be better because they're repeatable. So if this roughing finesse was to work, you could do it again and again and again. Whereas with a natural finesse, you can only do it as many times as you have cards. In this case, you can finesse once. So you have a choice. Now obviously, if West had passed and looked very miserable, and East had bid their socks off, and you knew that the King of Hearts was with East, then you might do the normal finesse. But I'm assuming we have no information. The roughing finesse is better because you can just keep doing it. Whereas the natural finesse, you finesse once and then you run out of cards, and so that's sort of the end of it. Okay. Now, the diamonds, that's an interesting one. This, you can actually combine all sorts together. So again, imagining diamonds aren't trumps. Uh, if we are in a diamonds trump contract, then we've not bid very well. Um, <laughs> we, we need to know where the king of diamonds is. Now, there's no roughing finesse going on here at the moment, because... Oh, hang on. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, because we haven't got any voids. So there's no roughing finesses because there's no shortage. Well, there is some shortage with North, but there's no roughing finesses yet. So this is just a normal sandwich finesse position. Remember, a sandwich finesse, you lead an honour out, threatening with them with their, the bigger honour. So you lead the queen towards your ace, or you lead the jack towards your king, depending on what you're missing. In this case, this is a normal sandwich finesse. You lead the queen, they have the king great, they have the king not so great. So again, imagining that West has the king, because it's more fun when things happen correctly. If they had something like that, 
They can't play the king on, well, they shouldn't play the king on the queen because they know that you're going to kill it with the ace and then that's going to establish your suit for you. So that's not good for them to do. So they should play small, hoping that you bottle it. Not that you will. You play low, and then they play low, and you know the finesse works. The problem you've now got is you can't repeat the sandwich finesse because you've run out of diamonds to play underneath your honours. If you play a diamond here, your ace is forced from the north because of the lack of them. So here, you play low. Of course, if the king appears, happy days, but it doesn't. Cross back to hand somehow, let's say in a side suit. And then you've now got a roughing finesse position against the known king. Because the queen finesse worked, you know where the king is. And you now created the void, and you've got the honours to roughing finesse. So when you lead the jack, they still can't play their king because you're going to trump it. So initially your threat was the ace, and now your threat is a trump. So poor West can never make their king. Do you see that? That's a combination of a sandwich finesse that then morphs into a roughing finesse through your shortage. Now that won't happen very often, but the point is they can come up in all different shapes and sizes. It's not always just king, queen, jack opposite a void or ace, queen, jack, opposite, a singleton. Though I will admit they're the most common ones. All right? Right, that's all. Fitting stuff. <coughs> now, when I spoke about transfers, I was speaking about the second bit. So when we first learn about transfers, I teach you that two diamonds mean hearts and two hearts mean spades, and you kind of feel like your world has just been turned upside down when you very first learn about it. And then you start to realise, actually, it's fairly straightforward. You just bid the suit below and get your partner to do your work. Mm -hmm. That's all well and good until you don't know what to do next. So, I'll say that. What I spoke about uh, last week was what to do after you have made a transfer bid. The idea behind the transfer bid are that you get two bids in a row, essentially, because your bid, two diamonds, tells your partner to bid for you. So essentially, your partner is not doing anything that tells you anything. They're doing as they're told. So really, you get two bids in a row, because your partner's bid is sort of moot. It doesn't really exist. So when you bid two diamonds, promising five cards in hearts, and they bid two hearts, you're essentially in a position where you've shown your heart, and now you want to do something else. Your partner hasn't really told you anything with that bid. So your second bid should describe your strength. Your first bid has described your five card major. Your second bid describes your strength. So if you're weak, you pass. You sort of go off logic. If you're weak, you pass. If you're invitational, invite. If you're game going, bid game. It's fairly straightforward. It's which game you've got to think about. So we've shown our five cards in hearts. Important to notice that we, if we bid more hearts, we're, bid, we're showing more hearts. So this being a heart bid, any more heart bids follows the same rules. Rebidding a suit promises six. So if you bid hearts, which you just have, then bidding hearts again is definitely a six card suit. The reason you will fall for this sometimes is because you look down at the table and think, oh, I've not bid my hearts yet. So you bid hearts. But actually you have bid your hearts by doing the transfer, so it's just something to watch out for. Another thing, thing to watch out for is you bid a transfer, they bid two hearts, and you are astounded that they've just bid the suit you've got five cards in. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you told them to. That's a very easy trap to fall into. When you do a transfer, you think, wow, you've got hearts, amazing, after four hearts we go. And they might have two small hearts, for all you know you force them to do it. So just, we'll just watch out for that. I appreciate that's a bit silly. Um, so we are game going here. We've got 13 points, so we want to be in game. Thir game going for me is 13 or more. Good 12. That kind of goes. Um, so we want to be in game, but we've already told them about our five cards in hearts. So we can't bid three hearts or four hearts, because that would promise six cards in hearts. Therefore, we need to bid the other game. The other game being three no trumps. If we bid three no trumps now, you could argue, well, why didn't we just bid three no trumps over one no trump? Why have you bothered doing a transfer? Is it just to show off that you know what transfers are? No, it's not. It's to tell your partner that you've got five cards in hearts and the game going hand. If you bid three no trumps straight over one no trump, you're just saying, I have a game going hand. And in fact, you're denying a five card or four card major because you haven't done a transfer or statement. So the transfer and then the game bid says, I'm game going with five hearts. What do you want to do? And if we were invitational, if I shade our points down by a couple and get us to 11, you can then do the invitational bit in no trumps, which is the favourite John Travolta, two no trumps, which says, I'm invitational with five cards in hearts. Okay, so your second bit describes your strength. Have your first bit 
primary bit having described your suit. Okay? So it's fairly straightforward. When you've got a five card major, you just transfer and then show your strength. Yeah. Your strength could be non existent. So therefore you pass as your second bit. That's also fairly logic based. You transfer to your five card suit and you're happy to play that because you don't think game is of any, of any interest. So with five cards in a major, transfer, then show your strength, whether that's pass, two no-trups, or three no-trups. With six cards in a major, you have to do some more stuff. So with six cards in a major, firstly, if you are, if you are weak, you still pass. The fact that you've got a sixth card in a suit, yes, that's good, but it doesn't mean you've suddenly got game on. You won't have game on still, because you just haven't got enough trumps, even though you've got well, enough points, really. If I create the invitational hand again, which was king of that one. Now, rather than just create some more room, rather than bidding two no trumps at the invitational bid, you want to show your six card suit. So what do you think will be invitational with six hearts? Three hearts. Three hearts. Because you bid hearts twice and you haven't bid game. Okay? Back to game going. Now not three hearts, but four hearts. No traps. Why do I know that four hearts is a good idea? Four hearts is game. <laughs> there you go. Because they've got at least two, so we want to be in four hearts, don't we? Mm -hmm. So depending on how much of a hog you are, you could not transfer and just bid four hearts if you wanted to play the hand. Or you could do the correct thing and transfer and then let your partner play the hand. Depends on how much you might play them. Um, the, w the reason this is better, transferring first, is because often the one no trumper wants the lead coming round to them. So statistically speaking, it's better to get the one no trumper to play it. But if you feel like, oh, I haven't played one in 15 hands, I'm playing this four hearts, then fair enough. But you can only do that when you know the game is on and you know that you need to play in a suit, i.e. a six card hand. So essentially, you transfer first. With a five card suit, you go back to no trumps or pass. With a six card suit, you bid your suit again or pass depending on where you are in the strength range, weak, invitational, or strong. Alright? Yeah. Right, appreciate that's a lot of info, but that's because it's mashed mm -hmm. into, into me speaking it's at the speed of light. Yes? Um, one Lord Trump, two diamonds, mm -hmm. could North come back three hearts? Yes, so that's something I'm going to cover in a different lesson. Right. But there is something known as breaking and bouncing the transfer. So I've, set, I've sort of had an obedient partner on the board here. They could bid anything other than two hearts. So that would be two spades, two N, three clubs, three diamonds, three hearts. They're all possible bids for them. I want to stress that's pretty rare that they do that. But all of these, apart from three hearts, they're all breaks. And what that says is that they have a good fit for you and a maximum. And a bounce is just a good fit, but not necessarily a maximum. So this is a bit more preemptive in nature. This is more cooperative, constructive in nature. But it doesn't happen very often. Probably sub 10%. In fact, definitely sub 10%. Um, the no trimmer doesn't have to complete the transfer, but you need quite specific things to break it or bounce it. Not only that, not all pairs even <coughs> play this. So this could even be argued as optional. Bounce it. Uh, once bounced before. Yeah, you can back. Yeah, if you got a five card major, you could bounce to four. That's what I think. But it's, it's super rare. It's super rare. Um, if you transfer, it's probably 95% of the time they will complete. So you're fairly safe. Unless you've got a particularly disobedient partner who does what they want. Oh. But. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <coughs> Any questions on all that? No? Okay. 